Seattle. My name is Jeff Chester and I'm the Public Affairs Officer here at the United States Naval Observatory, located in the other Washington, Washington, D.C. We are one of the most unusual commands in the entire United States Navy because what we do involves looking at the sky to help you figure out where you are on the land and on the oceans. It's a, an incredibly amazing group of people that work here. A very small group, but without the work that's done here, a lot of the things that we take for granted in our day-to-day -day lives won't exist. So let's find out a little bit more. Let's go inside. The Naval Observatory was established by an order from the Secretary of the Navy to a young Navy lieutenant named Louis Goldsboro on December 6th of the year 1830. That makes us one of the oldest scientific organizations in the federal government, and we have been performing our duties continuously since that time. For most of the history of the observatory, our main concern was telling time. And time is something that's very important because it is an integral part of navigation, trying to figure out where you are on the surface of the Earth. So in order to properly navigate, you have to have a clock called a chronometer. And that chronometer has to be calibrated so that you know how fast or how slow it runs over a long period of time. Because there is no such thing as a perfect clock, and no two clocks tick at exactly the same rate. So the observatory was established as the U.S. Navy Depot of Charts and Instruments way back in 1830 with that purpose in mind. And in those days, the best available time scale that we had to calibrate clocks was determined by the mean rotation rate of the Earth itself. So if you are going to measure the rotation rate of the Earth, you have to have an astronomical observatory in order to do that and you need a very specialized kind of instrument to do that as well. So, this marvelous machine that you see behind me is basically a time measuring machine. It's called a transit circle. And the way it works is it can only look at objects that cross an imaginary line that goes from north to south with a point directly overhead called your local meridian line. And the Earth's rotation every day will carry celestial objects, the sun, moon, planets, bright stars, across that line. We can predict when those events are going to occur. So if we measure them very precisely, we can establish very precisely what time it is. Once we do this, we can then check the clock over a period of several months and see how fast or how slow it runs over that long term. Once it's calibrated, it can then be issued to a ship and it can be used successfully for determining longitude at sea. Which, up until the middle part of the 20th century, was practically the only way that we had of determining longitude at sea. Since that time, we have developed a number of other technologies that allow us to keep more precise time scales, and today we don't depend on the Earth's rotation to tell us what time it is anymore. For that, we use atomic frequency standards, otherwise known as atomic clocks. So the room that you're seeing behind me is the home of the U.S. Naval Observatory's master clock. This is where time begins here in the United States. We distribute time from this location to points all over the world using the global positioning system. And there are a number of other ways that we have of getting time to you, our end users. Why is this critical? Well, global positioning system is a worldwide system that allows you to determine your position on the surface of the Earth to an accuracy of a couple of meters. And it does that by utilizing time, time transmitted from a number of satellites. 
those satellites all have atomic clocks on board and those clocks, just like the chronometers in the old days, need to be calibrated. So the equipment that we have here allows us to essentially calibrate those clocks every day. In order for them to be precise, our master clock system has to be ultra precise. So our system keeps time to a precision that's measured on the order of about 100 trillionths of a second per day. To think of this another way, our timing system here will not gain or lose one second in about 30 million years. This is the U.S. Naval Observatory's 26-inch telescope known as the Great Equatorial Refractor. This telescope was originally purchased in the year 1873, and in 1877 it was used to discover Phobos and Deimos, the two moons of Mars. We still use this telescope today for nightly observations of types of objects called double stars. And we need to understand double stars so that we can find solutions for star positions used in navigation and also the physical nature of the stars themselves. Let's go meet some of the folks that actually observe with this wonderful old instrument. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Rachel Madsen and I work here at USNO in the uh, Celestial Reference Frame Department and I am one of the people who gets to use the 26 inch telescope that you just learned about. Um, one of the projects, or the main project that we use that telescope for is double stars, observing double stars. And a double star is any star that basically when you look and see one in the night sky, there's another one right there next to it. And some of these are just um, an optical illusion. They look right next to each other in the sky, but they aren't necessarily have anything to do with each other. But there are also ones that are actually physically bound. They actually orbit around each other. Those are called binaries. And so we monitor specifically either ones, but specifically binary stars because we are looking for the motion because if you are using a star for navigation, for a star track or something like that, if you are looking at this kind of central blob, if there's actually two stars or more in there, you are actually, that blob is going to move around in a certain way. And so by observing these double stars, we can actually look and see where both of the two stars in there are, as well as actually learn about their orbits if they rotate around each other. And this can help with understanding the motion of how that center of light of the star is going to change and be able to predict that and measure that. I'm Tom Swanson. I'm a physicist who works in the clock development group uh, in the precise time department at the United States Naval Observatory. And this is a Rubidium Fountain atomic clock, one of four that we have here in Washington, D.C., one of seven Rubidium Fountain clocks that we built in our group. The, these clocks were designed, all the research and uh, development happened here at the Naval Observatory with my colleagues and myself. And these are some of the best continuously running atomic clocks that exist today. The piece here that looks like a hot water heater contains what we call the physics package. It's where we trap the atoms and manipulate them. And we have two equipment racks that contain lasers and the electronics to control various uh, parts of the clock. The ticking you can hear is shutters opening and closing as we turn the light on and off in various parts uh, of the fountain to manipulate the atoms. Okay, so what we have here is an uh, image of our fountain cut halfway down the middle. Uh, the way the fountain works is we use lasers to confine the atoms and cool them down. Laser cooling and trapping is the, the name of the technology that won the Nobel Prize back in 1997. Get the atoms uh, 10 billion or so of them, very, very cold, uh, down to about a millionth of a degree above absolute zero. And then using the lasers again, we can nudge them upward. Uh, this is the fountain action for which it's named. And by getting them very cold, the atoms are not going to spread out very much as we toss them. The atoms move up. We shine some uh, microwaves on them here in a cavity to put them in the proper quantum state and then laser shine on them to push atoms that are in the wrong state out of the, out of the beam. Atoms continue up, 
they go into another microwave cavity, which is where we start the clocks ticking. The atoms will oscillate between two different states as they move up through the drift region. And they spend about a half a second going up and back down to this microwave cavity. And during this time, the atoms are ticking between the states. They see the microwaves again, and that stops the ticking. And the atoms will be in one of two states, depending on whether the atoms frequency and the microwave frequency are in agreement or how much they are in disagreement. So the frequency performance of these atoms is encoded in which state the atom is in once that part of the uh, operation is done. The atoms fall back down, pulled by gravity, and we shine lasers on them again. And the atoms will fluoresce depending on which state they are in one of two different regions. And what we do is we collect that light and the signal we get from each region gives us information about the frequency of those atoms as compared to the microwaves that we've shined on them. And that gives us the information about what the frequency is of our clock. That's one measurement and we keep doing this measurement because every time you do this, you will start averaging out any noise that you have in your clock. A single measurement, which takes about a second, will give us a measurement at about two parts in 10 to the 13. And then if we keep doing that, we average this down, the noise is diminished, and we can get, after a long time running, we can get it to uh, a performance that is better than a part in 10 to the 16. Uh, what that relates to in terms of a real measurement is about 10 nanoseconds or better over the course of a year. Hi, my name is Jennifer Taylor, and I'm a research physicist at the Naval Observatory in the Precise Time Department. We're standing in our research lab where we'll, we are building the next generation of clocks for the master clock time scale. As opposed to the current clocks, which are based on microwave frequencies, the next generation of clocks will be based on optical frequencies, 10 to the 15 hertz. That's like taking a ruler with inch marks and adding 64th inch marks. That's the way that we're able to make a more precise measurement of time by adding ticks to our ruler. So the way that we're going to do that is to use lasers to interact with atoms. And the research that we do here in this lab is uh, building prototypes um, that will eventually become the next clocks that we add to the master.